Welcome to our preview of a prototype version of the light abstract war game Battle of Gog. Thanks to the designer for lending us this prototype of Battle of Gog to check out. Now, before I say anything else, I need to make everyone well aware that this review is based on an incomplete prototype copy of Battle of Gog. Now, besides the usual fact that's true for any prototype that the component quality is going to change, there's also a very good chance the rules for this game will also be updated by the time it's released to the public. In the last few weeks I've been trying this game out, the designer has changed a couple of rules significantly. And at this point, I would go so far as to say Battle of Gog is still being developed. This is not a finished game yet. Due to this, all of the information I share tonight is subject to change, hopefully being tweaked and improved for the better once the game comes out. Now, this is in many ways actually refreshing, at least to me, since Kickstarter isn't being used as a finished product ordering system this time, <laughs> but actually kickstarting a project that has potential but needs some time and money to get across the finish line. And I totally agree with you here. Like at this point, we are so used to Kickstarter being used for finished games, mainly looking for funding to get it printed or just as using it as a pre-order system to determine the size of a print run. It to me is great to see people still using Kickstarter for what it was created to do make someone's dream a reality. That said, I will say this made reviewing this a little more difficult than expected. Understandable. It is certainly not something we're used to seeing with Kickstarter previews. Sure, components change and upgrade, but the game itself is usually well done these days. So everything about Battle of Gog is credited to Vitaly Minin. He is not only the designer, but also the developer, artist, lead artist, editor, graphic designer, and more. He actually has every spot on Board Game Geek filled out for this game. This is honestly the epitome of a self-published independent board game. Vitaly is attempting to bring this game to life through a Kickstarter project that launched on June the 8th. Assuming it's successful, the game will be published under his own company, Crazy Box Inc. Now, Battle of Gog plays two to four players, with our games taking under an hour and a half, very much depending on the number of players playing. Now, I don't think Vitaly has any plans for this to hit retail, so this isn't going to be something you'll be able to pick up Target, Walmart, or your local game store, so there's no official MSRP, but you can get it on Kickstarter now for $39 US, which I've got to say, based on the component, quality here alone is very reasonable. Unfortunately, there's not a lot to see about this on Board Game Geek yet either, so... Yeah, yeah there's a bunch of free is... produ production, and that's about it. I yeah. should probably upload a bunch of my images. <laughs> Now, in Battle of God, players take on one of four kingdoms in Canaan who are competing for land while trying to find and collect the five scrolls handed down to Gog from God. Players start with only three soldiers and will use those initial soldiers to found cities. Once cities are founded, players will begin to collect resources that can be used to improve uh, and hire soldiers, improve the soldiers, improve your cities, increase your resource storage, and more. There are multiple paths for victory, which include controlling the four areas of the map, eliminating an opponent's city, or collecting all five of the scrolls. Now, normally, this is where I would direct you to an unboxing video on YouTube. But due to the fact that this game is a prototype, we didn't want to record a video due to the fact that the components could and probably will change with the final production copy. Correct. Now, my version of Battle of Gog came in a rather thin but large game box. Uh, it's important to know that this is larger than your average game, and there is no way this will fit in a Kallax shelf, which is the most popular board game shelf that people tend to pick up or versions of it, which I got to say right away is going to turn some gamers off. If I was Vitaly, I would have shrunk everything down just enough to fit. Now, inside this box was a well-designed plastic insert containing a number of different components. You got train tiles, the scroll tiles, some tarot-sized reference farm and ability cards, deck of treasure cards, and a ton of resource tiles in three types. There are also two miniatures, one for Gog and one for the Angel of Retribution, and then a number of dice, larger city dice and smaller soldier dice in each of the four player colors. Now, if they reach a stretch goal, the dice will get kicked up a notch to a new mm. design, and there's also the ability to buy a 16-inch statue of the Gog model as well. Now, the dice do look cool. Um, I actually really like how the city dice have crenellations on them to make them stick out from the soldier dice. As for the Statue of Gog, not for me, but hey, someone might be interested in Now, one of the components that needs to be called out is the box, because the box itself is a component required to play this game, not just store it. It's designed so that when you put the lid on and then flip it over, 
the back becomes a sunken playing surface that you're going to use to build and hold the map tile. Now, this is an interesting and unique aspect to the game that we've talked about a little previously, but also means you need to make sure you take care of your box, mm -hmm. which, as noted, is larger than most of your hobby boxes. Now, again, I have a prototype copy. I will admit it showed up and it's been to a couple of reviewers before me and one corner is split, which I just taped together, but it does make it harder to hold the tiles in place. And you need those tiles because the first thing you do in a game of Battle of Gog is build the map. You're going to use the train tiles and the back of the game box. You're going to add them one at a time in player order. These tiles feature a three by three grid of squares with a number of different terrain types and features on them. These include things like water, fish, forests, fields, caravans, and more. Now, the only restriction when placing tiles that can be anywhere on the board is once there's a water section on the map, future tiles that feature water have to be connected if possible. Now, one weird idiosyncrasy in this game that does take some adjusting to is all of us board gamers are used to things being orthogonally adjacent. In this, diagonals are also considered adjacent. This is really important when placing the rivers and the way forests work, because cities collecting from a forest can only collect one wood no matter the size of the forest. So amusingly, the demo images on Board Game Geek don't follow those rules about water. That's interesting. Maybe that was a rule that changed since they originally took the pictures. That's highly possible. I had to say grouping the water works well. You end up like a, either one big river through the middle or little lakes. It's, it's actually a good mechanic as far as I'm concerned. Now, once the map's built, each player picks a corner, then puts three level one soldiers on the board. Now, soldiers in this game are represented by small D6 dice, and the pip showing up is what level they are. So you're going to put a bunch of dice out at level one. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are three ways to win a battle a bug game. Take out the last city of one opponent, or in a variant, take out all, but I don't recommend that. Have a soldier in each of the four corners of the map. Note you start the game controlling one, or collect the five scrolls. So I must say the variety of win conditions isn't as common mm -hmm. as I would have expected in board games. Uh, and it's really nice to have, along with this flexible, flexible world generation, options as to what direction you want to go in the game to try and win on top of that, you know, in randomness at the beginning. And the other thing I've liked is in our plays, we've shifted. You may be trying to wipe out your opponent's cities, but then you notice you've got three scrolls. So maybe I want to switch the scrolls. Or then you happen to get the right treasure card, which lets you move some troops. You're like, I might be able to grab the four corners. And I like how that's shifted and it gives you more options. Now, each turn in GOG starts with the active player generating resources. Each level one city on the map collects the resources from the eight surrounding squares. Level two or higher cities increase the reach by one more square. Now, the resources include food, which are gained from fields, fish, pheasants, and herd animals, wood gained from forests, gold gained from mines. Now, in addition, if you have at least one city in play, each of your soldiers will collect any resource they're standing on and if they're also in a zone where an opponent's city is, they prevent that opponent from collecting that resource. Now, at the start of the game, you can only have five of each resource type, but there is a way to increase this. So pretty standard resource concepts there and mm -hmm. some nice, uh, nice plays with blocking and, and things. Now, one thing that's kind of unique to this game, and I almost didn't want to get into because it's a little fiddly, but there is one spot on the map every game that has a scroll on it. If you have a city that can collect from this spot, you collect a scroll the first time you generate resources from that spot. This scroll cannot be stolen unless someone takes out the city. Now, if that spot isn't in a city's collection area, just out of the map somewhere, a soldier landing on that spot can collect a scroll, but only once per game per player. Now, if you go to collect a scroll and there's none left in the supply, you actually get to steal them from another player. And again, collecting five scrolls, there are only five in the game, is one way to win. Seems like the odds of not having to defeat at least one city of a player to get those five scrolls is slim to impossible. In a way, except for there is a way to purchase scrolls. And as I'll get into later, it's one of the things that the designer keeps playing with the amount. The first games we played, we didn't bother fighting because we just bought the scrolls with gold because they were way too cheap. But that rule has already changed. So once they figure out a good balance for scrolls and the fact that maybe you can only buy one around, that may make it so combat becomes pretty common. Right. Again, reminder, this game isn't quite finished yet. Now, after generating resources, you spend them. Uh, this is pretty typical of any of these games where you collect stuff and spend it to get stuff. You can buy new soldiers. You can upgrade existing soldiers, improve your farms and cities. You can buy these really powerful ability cards, which feature almost game-breakingly strong special powers. And, well, you can buy scrolls, as I just mentioned. 
And here, when you're buying scrolls, if there are no scrolls in the supply, you get to steal one from another player. So it doesn't matter what they've taken over, except if that player has that one city that happened to have the scroll tile on it, and then they can't take it unless you kill their city. Again, that part's the one really fiddly bit of this game. Now, when paying for these improvements, if you have a caravan within resource collection distance or one of your soldiers on it, you can trade resources one to the one with the bank for each caravan that you control. And a, and a caravan is a feature on the board, correct? Not yes. a mobile game element? Yeah, it's, it's it looks like a camel. And they're on, on the board. There's so many out every game. Now, once done spending resources, you then collect any treasure. All over the board are little treasure chests. Like resources, they're collected by having a city within range or having a soldier on them. There are 24 different treasures in the game, and they're split between positive and negative effects. Now, when you collect a treasure, you have to roll a die to see if it affects you or your opponents, which I thought was a really strange rule. Now, if you do happen to draw a negative effect and it's affecting you, you do get to ignore it. Now, these treasures do all kinds of things like upgrading soldiers in plays, upgrading or downgrading cities, letting you or your opponents move soldiers, gaining free resources, gaining a scroll, and so on. Because they also have negative and positive effects and may affect your opponent, if you can collect a treasure, you must. So it doesn't really sound like something you want to skip, even if it might benefit your opponent, as the odds of doing nothing or benefiting you directly uh, or by hurting an opponent seem to be in your favor overall. I have mixed thoughts on this one. For the number of games we played, like, like the benefits here can be huge and really swing a game. There is one where it's like, if I roll all my opponents, I'm playing a four player game and I draw the treasure and it's upgrade three soldiers, three levels and it affects all my opponents, I'm probably out of that game. So it just, it really depends on your play style too, because it's random, right? Deanna hates these. She hates the treasures because she's all about player agency and being a master of her own destiny and planning ahead. So she avoids the treasure. My girls, on the other hand, wanted as many as they could get because they loved the chaos and how everything got messed up every turn by them. Right. And I don't know, I, I, I found them to be a little risky. So I started to stay away from them. My first games, I grabbed them. My later games, I'm like, no, let other people play with the treasure. Really starting Especially to notice, if you're playing more than one person. So really starting to notice the theme with your kids. I think maybe leaving the realms of chaos around in their rooms when they were leaning to learning to read worked after all. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> Definitely my youngest. My youngest likes the chaos in the game. So once you've spent your resources, revealed any treasure, you're gonna roll the dice. Now we turn this into a roll and move game. If you roll a double, something special happens. This could be moving the angel of retribution or gog or gaining one of those ability cards I mentioned. Now, you want to unleash the Angel of Retribution on your opponents. Any one city being visited by the Angel is too busy dealing with it and can't collect resources. On the opposite side, you want Gog to visit your cities. If you manage to do that, you immediately get a full amount of resources, stock up to your max, and then your city is actually protected from the Angel of Retribution, and enemies attacking need to be twice the level to take out your city. All right, so Gog, good, angel, bad. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, this is based on the Old Testament. These aren't cute, winged cherub angels. This is uh, looks all more like a mountain than anything else. Now, after dealing with doubles, you're going to use your dice to move your troops. Total rolled can be split up any way you want over any number of soldiers. So lots of options here. The only real limitation on movement is that you can't cross over water unless your soldiers are at least level three with a weird special exception, expansion if, uh, sorry, exception, if you haven't founded all your cities yet. After you move a soldier, you do have an option to found a city. So once you put a soldier out, you get them to a spot you like, you can then throw it away. Um, if you don't have three on the board, you only get three cities total. To found a city, you just replace the soldier with a larger city die, which is set to level one. No, no matter what level the soldier was. So if you, Cid yep, sorry, yep. Cities are required to start generating resources. So that's vital. You want to get your first city out as early as possible in the game because that's your ability to build up your forces and win the game. Right. And so you want to carefully balance city placement so you're not overlapping acquisition areas at higher levels, I'm assuming? Or can you double down on a resource possible? All right. So I, I went for the simple overview for, for the, the um, podcast here, but I will explain some of the city placement rules a bit more. So cities have to be placed at least two squares away. From another city more than two there has to be at least two squares between your cities both yours and your opponents now each resource can only be collected by a single player once a turn so overlapping resources with your own cities is bad but overlapping resources with an opponent just means you both get to collect it 
Now, you can deny a city its resources, which is one of the mean things you could do by putting one of your soldiers on the resource. Then you collect it and they don't. Right. So a good bit of strategy and thought process into that beyond just get good stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, battles occur by moving one of your soldiers onto an opponent. Soldiers are the same level. It's just a D6 roll. Whoever rolls higher defeats the other and gets the spot. More interestingly, if you're not tied, though, the higher level soldier wins the fight, but is reduced in level by the level of the lower soldier. So a level five attacks a level three, the level three is removed, and level five gets knocked down to a level two. So familiar enough to players of small world. Yeah. Now you can also attack cities. Uh, this requires that you siege the city by surrounding it with at least three troops, and they have to be of a level equal to or greater than the city's level. When a city's conquered, instead of losing ranks, the attacking soldiers actually level up, and you gain one of those five scrolls. Now, in addition to these combat rules, there are a couple spots in the map that modify combat. Soldiers that are standing on ruins count as one level higher, and there are two volcanoes on the board, and anyone in the volcano can't be attacked at all. I don't quite get the thematic rev reason for that, but whatever, that's the rule. Now, once a specific soldier has fought, you can't move further, so you can't steamroll. You can't like use a six to take out a four and then take out a one. Once you've attacked once, you're done, you gotta stop. Now, once movement's completed, player passes to the next player in clockwork order, and you just keep going around until someone completes one of the three video con or video victory conditions. And there we have it, the Battle of Gog. Now, I first saw Battle of Gog on the excellent Brains on Games YouTube channel uh, from friend of the show and fellow Canadian podcaster Brian McDonald. Now, the main things that stood out to me watching his uh, preview of the game was how the map was built, how the deterministic combat system was about the ranks being reduced and how resource generation worked. Those were the aspects of the game I was most interested in trying myself. And in regards to those three aspects, I was not disappointed in GOG at all. I think the way GOG uses the back of the box to build the map is rather brilliant. Not only does the box design hold the tiles in place, but it, more importantly, it provides a grid so you know where to place the tiles. It's something you need because you can place tiles anywhere. This just wouldn't work if you were just playing on your normal game table. Without the box, you'd still need some kind of play mat or something. And then once you get into a play mat, you got to worry about tile shifting. So actually, the box thing is really brilliant. Yeah, so this is in part because the 6x6 six six grid side of the map makes it possible but not easy to lay out, a, a lay out this map without those grid lines in place. Yeah, and like you'd want a non-stick mat or, or non-slip mat or something. It, it really does work. Now, once the map's done... It, felt like i'm playing civ 2 on my amiga at this point like it just the, just the look of the map and then that was reinforced by the way the cities work right when you go to your city view in civ 2 and you get to see the resources around your city and how much food and population you generate i just got that feel from this so i liked it I, and the fact that when you level up your city you get to a wider circle i thought that was neat now what was strange though is that there are only three resources in the game which just seemed odd to me because there were so many different icons that all meant food which I, I guess it was done to keep it simple. And I almost wonder if the game was more complex originally and he reduced it so that the different types of foods didn't matter. But like there aren't multiple types of mines for gold and there aren't multiple um, woods. Like there's just forests or forests. There's nothing else. Right. So I got a Minecraft feel from the map tiles actually, but yeah. you're right. It's weird to have those multiple icons for a single resource type. Yeah. So another thing that felt odd is only being able to have, hold five resources. And it wasn't based on how many cities you had. And when we first played, it was a rush to find spots that will gather everything. Like this city's going to get two wood and three food and also this and this. Well, you do want to do this to some extent, be able to collect more than what you can hold as a waste. The max you can get up to is a farm size of seven. So you can only have seven of each resource type. And the same thing for using your soldiers. So like at first, I'm like, I'm going to get the city with all this stuff. And then I'm going to move my soldiers onto resources and then I'm going to get all this stuff, but I'm not. I think you have a hard limit on how much you can hold. But this also folds into how important it is to up that limit, right? You probably want to get a farm out pretty early, up to the sixth level at least. So I got to say, our last gameplay, no one upgraded their farm. So early games, we were using all the time. Later games, we, well, to be honest, more crowded board was harder to get resources, so we didn't need them. Right. So pacing is really kind of the key. You want the right amount of resources coming in for your farms, mm -hmm. I'm balancing it all out. Now, using resources just feels right. Um, so I do look forward to when the game has some more development done and the costs are locked down instead of changing. It feels like every time I play. 
because this is the aspect of the game the designer has been playing with the most right now. And actually, like, writing me and saying, hey, try scrolls costing this much, or hey, try making upgrading your farms cost three of each resource instead of two. Like, this has happened quite a bit. And the cost of buying scrolls has literally changed every time we played the game. Like, I, I have suggested things to him, like, why not make it cost six? Because then you'd have to upgrade your farm before buying scrolls, and no one could do it early in the game. And then we found a card combo where you can use any resources, anything, and someone could potentially buy four scrolls in one turn. I'm like, that doesn't seem right. So this is in flux a lot right now. Right. It, economies are hard and often the ruination of a game when not done correctly. Yeah, our first game, the scrolls only cost two gold each. And it was that the whole game was just, I buy scroll, you buy scroll, I buy scroll, you buy scroll. And all we bothered collecting was gold. We didn't even worry about soldiers and fighting. So right. this is, it's, it's definitely like, it feels right, but it just needs balance. Now, the resource generation spending it made me feel like Catan. Like I sit there every turn and I look and I go, okay, how much wood do I get? Okay, how much of the food do I get? Okay, how do I get that? And then I grab the, the 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 chart that comes in the game and go, okay, what can I buy with this? I got three food. What can I get for three food? That felt very Catan like to me. Now the other game that comes to mind whenever I'm playing Battle of Gog is Small World that Sean mentioned earlier, and that's due to that deterministic battle system. I love that really simple system. I love that. It it just makes sense. Higher level unit wins and then is reduced by the level of the lower unit. And, and I love that. I like the lack of randomness, especially when there's so much more randomness in other aspects of this game. As we've talked about quite recently, randomness is fine with the right levels of mitigation. Yeah. And, and to be honest, that randomness is my biggest problem with Battle of Guck. This game is extremely random with so many in-game elements rewarding high rolls with no real catch-up mechanic or, or bonus for ruling badly. Like, this becomes evident right from the first turn of the game, where all players are scrambling to send those three soldiers out and to claim sections of the board and found their city. A player rolling low here is going to be at a disadvantage that could potentially last the entire game. Similarly, rolling low even later in the game can greatly impact your ability to move your troops where they need to be, either to attack, defend, or even just to collect resources. Then there's bonuses. If you get lucky enough to roll doubles, you also get to move Gog or the Angel or gain one of those ability cards. So it's just like, it just comes up now and then, and all of a sudden you get this thing. And like I said before, these ability cards are extremely powerful. They include things like being able to move over any amount of water for one move, getting five extra movement every turn, gaining three free resources of your choice every turn, or being able to use any resource to pay any cost and more. And then there's that treasure chest system I was talking about before. Not only is it a 24 card deck, so it's random what you get and what it's going to do, but you also have to roll another die to see if it happens to you or everyone else. And often it gives an advantage to your opponents, even though like you're the one that collected the treasure. It just feels off. It feels like if I collect the treasure, I should get the thing. Yeah, and, and the randomness from even before the game starts with the random layout of the board. Well, like I guess it is a random layout of the board, but the players are the ones putting it out. So at least there's some agency there. Right. You do kind of get to control your own fate. Now, while randomness can be good for games, right? One of the things it does is keeps things interesting. And it makes it so the game's infinitely replayable. Because you're probably going to be on a different map every time. There's a 36 different map tiles. I don't know what six to the power of 36 is, but that's your number of possible different maps. Or sorry, it'd be six to the power of 36 to the power of 34 to the power of 35 or whatever it is, or six to the power, the, the whatever math. There's lots <laughs> of possible combinations. Um, so I get that. And it also, and this is something I think that was done to make it feel like a family game. And this is something game designers have been doing for years. And the reason some people think that free parking is fun in Monopoly is that it makes it fun for players of different skill levels. That no matter how bad you're playing, you might get that lucky roll to get that thing that still lets you win. I personally and most of our family found the randomness to be a step above what we usually look for. Like it's so high that it interferes with your ability to plan ahead, which in a war game is an issue. Yeah, well, it might not be an issue for all players. Uh, the more towards a hardcore hobby gamer you become, yeah. the more adverse to randomness you you get. And as you want that strategic planning, that's your skill in strategic planning is what's making some of yes. these hobby games fun for you. Now, I do want to mention a couple things before I get into final thoughts. So one is Battle of Gog is a biblically themed game. 
This is based on the story of Gog and Magog from chapter 38 of the book of Ezekiel. This is a pair that also comes up much later in very different roles in the book of Revelation to John. What I think is important here, though, is that the game uses the story of Gog as a theme and only as a theme. I actually appreciate the fact the game doesn't do any evangelizing at all. Like there's no preaching going on. And to be honest, it doesn't even mention anywhere that this is based on a biblical story. It's not even like you get a Bible reference. Though I do worry the biblical theme might scare people away. They're like, oh, it's a it's a biblical game. I don't think there's any reason this should scare anyone away. Yeah, the the vast majority of Gog um mythology seems to actually primarily be in ap apocalyptic, prophetic, non-biblical texts. Mm. Uh, the Bible itself actually has very little mention of Gog and describes Magog as a place in the Old Testament, but a person in the New. So the biblical associations shouldn't really attract or scare you from this project. They're just the dressing used for an interesting game. The final aspect of Battle of Gog I want to talk about again before final thoughts is player count. So the game's listed as two to four players. And yes, it works. You can play the game as written at all those player counts. We just found it didn't work very well with two players. Now, one problem being the map's too big. Like you're looking at 36 square tiles and you can take over anywhere. You're not fighting over territory. You can found a city in nice happy spots. And the other problem with two players though is once one player got ahead, there wasn't really anything to slow them down. Where with more players, Alliances can be made, not necessarily a handshake alliances, but just gang up on the leader, right? This one player is doing too well. So anyone gaining an early lead can be held back by the other players. With the full player count of four, there isn't enough space on the board for everyone to have happy cities that collect lots of stuff every turn. With four, you'll be lucky if you can get one really good resource generating cities with your other two, maybe grabbing one or two resources every turn and that's it due to just space on the board. And moving soldiers onto opponents' resources becomes more important. Where in a two-player game, well, if you're stopping me from collecting wood here, I'll just go get it over there. And then you end up with really neat situations. Like in our last game, I was in the position to take out one of Gigi's cities. And if I did that, I would get a scroll. But it opened up the possibility for Grace to take out her last city on the other side of the board. And then she was in the same position with me. If she took out that city, I could get the other one. So it ended up Gigi's perfectly safe. She's in this position where if either of us attack our cities, it gives the game to each other. So it let her build up, which I thought was a really fun aspect of the game. So I can't recommend this game at two, the way it is written now. Now, again, this game's still in process. And I did send a suggestion to the designer that remove the game, remove a row from the top side, play five by five or four by four playing with playing with two players. That, I think, would work, though that's not official and it is something they're going to possibly check as a stretch goal in the Kickstarter because he seems to want to then provide a smaller board, which I don't think is necessary. I think you could just remove the corners and it'd still work. You wouldn't have to worry about stuff shifting, but to each own. So it's too big for a two-player, and is it too small for a four-player, or did that scarcity really work out well? Oh, no, it's like perfect for a four-player. It's, yeah. it's that you can't get everything you want, so you're going to have to settle, which I think works for a war game. You know what? This is the whole thing with two-player. You don't want a war game where there's nothing to compete over. It's like, I've got my three cities, you've got your three cities. And it goes back to the thing we were talking about where, well, you're just going to try to buy the scrolls before me, and I'm not going to bother attacking you because i got to take out all three of your cities. That's just not going to happen. Right. Now, I do say this is how the game is now, right? I mentioned this before. And, and, and the overall feeling I got from this game is that it's not finished, which it's not. Fair enough, right? I said that right at the top. Unlike some games that launch on Kickstarter, fully finished with finalized rules and components, this is still a work in progress. And it's something I had to keep reminding myself, right? I had to keep this in mind when playing the game and talking about the game and sharing stuff on Instagram and reviewing it here. This game is still in the middle of the development and playtesting phase. And to be honest, the designer has admitted it. This hasn't been sent to an editor yet which is why I didn't mention the layout, spelling, and grammatical issues and rule omissions, because I know the game's not done. Now, taking that fact into account, it's not finished, it's not polished. We did have a lot of fun playing Battle of God. Like, the, as I mentioned at the top of this, the, the aspects of the game I expected to like, I liked. The way battles represented, the abstract tiles, the use of dice to represent armies, cities, works really well. I love the deterministic combat system that uses dice to great effect. And 
I, while I wish the resource collection and spending system had a little bit more variety and there was a little bit more than three resources, I get it because he was trying to do a simple family weight game. There's honestly a lot to like in Battle of God. Now, my family is somewhat split on their opinions. My oldest daughter loved it. My youngest felt there were too many things you had to think about at once. And Deanna and I both thought it was solid, but just isn't quite there. There's just not enough there for us to love it. it didn't wow us. We had fun playing with it. It just feels like it needs something more. And I hope that gets added. I hope with future development and playtesting, the game gets that added boost it seems to need. So I would also like to note that the schedule laid out on the Kickstarter seems a bit accelerated. So while I have no reason to doubt the determination to fulfill should the game hit its goal, I do have concerns about their ability to fulfill in the allotted time. Mm. Though, if they have their distribution channels locked in, I would be happy to be proven wrong. Yeah, it's a Kickstarter. Do, do your due diligence, buyer beware, all the usual stuff with the Kickstarter. I will note this is their first project, so it's not like they have experience having published games before. Battle of Gog is a pretty simple, I would almost say gateway level abstract war game that has a good chance of appealing, appealing to fans of light folk on a map game, especially folk on a map games that include things like founding cities and gathering resources. This game reminds me of like a mashup of civilization, like Civ 2, the old Civ, Civ 2, Catan, and Small World. And I think fans of those games may find things they will like in GOG. There's a lot I liked, and I think it's worth giving a shot if you're into white abstract war games. While I personally found the randomness to be a little too high for my taste, I'm certain that'll actually be an advantage to other groups. We'll see that as a, a benefit. Most of all, again, what I played wasn't finished, so I can only assume that the final version will be even better than the game we've been playing the last few weeks. And that's it for our look at the Battle of Gog. You can read more about this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.